In this video lecture, we're going to discuss the topic of human error. We're going to look over Chapter 5 of The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Before we go on and talk about anything new, let's review the things we've talked about so far. Remember your vocabulary terms. You'll need them for the test coming up. You need to know what affordances are, what signifiers are, what constraints, mapping, feedback, conceptual models, and system images are. You'll also know, need to know the double diamond design model, the four D's of it, discover, define, develop, and deliver. You'll need to know what they are, their order, and what they mean. You also need to know the parts of the HCD process, observing, ide ideating, prototyping, and testing. You also need to know the difference between activities and tasks, what the gulf of execution is and the gulf of evaluation, the three different levels of processing cognition and emotion, visceral, behavioral, and reflective. You'll need to know the sequence of action to bridge those two gulfs of execution and evaluation, forming goals, planning actions, specifying action sequences, performing actions, perceiving the state of the world, interpreting the perception, and comparing to the goal. You'll need to remember which of those belong to which gulf and what order they belong in. You'll also need to know about constraints. You'll need to know what physical constraints are, cultural constraints, semantic constraints, and logical constraints. And then you'll also need to know about forcing functions, what are interlocks, lock-ins, and lock-outs. Now that we've reviewed, let's move on. The topic for this chapter is errors, human errors. The thing is, why do errors exist? You're tempted to say, oh, geez, uh, you know, human error, you know, uh, the user is to blame, the user did something wrong. Well, that's true. Sometimes it does happen. For example, um, well, people like, uh, I don't know, Homer Simpson. I can't stand it any longer. This whole plant is insane. Insane, I tell you. It, it, ah, 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 I can be lazy, too. Look at me. I, I'm a worthless employee, just like Homer Simpson. Give me a promotion. Oh, I eat like a slob, but nobody minds. I'm peeing on the seat. Give me a raise. Now I'm returning to work without washing my hands. But it doesn't matter because I'm Homer Simpson. I don't need to do my work because someone else will do it for me. Do, do, do. Hey, you okay, Grimy? I'm better than okay. I'm Homer Simpson. <laughs> you wish. Oh, hi, Mr. Burns. I'm the worst worker in the world. Time to go home to my mansion and eat my lobster. What's this? Extremely high voltage. Well, I don't need safety gloves because I'm Homer Sip. Frank Grimes, or grimy as he liked to be called, taught us that a man can triumph over adversity. So you see the problem here. Sometimes it is true that people just do things wrong. But at the same time, that's really not fair to people generally, and it's also not true. Yes, there is human error, and it can be centered in the people who use it, but usually there's a problem with some sort of design, some sort of problem that leads people to make errors. For example, and even though... One of the things that bad design will commonly do is ask people to do, to do things that are just unnatural, that aren't, uh, that would not make sense for them to do. All right, girls, now this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her roll! <laughs>
<laughs> Fine, you're doing splendidly. Speed it up a little! So that's just straight up not natural. It's too fast, you know. Uh, it's exaggerated, of course. But at the same time, that actually sort of thing happens to people at work. They get overloaded, and they're asked to do things that they just can't do. Sometimes bad design assumes that we live in a world that has no interruptions at all. This is one of the bigger, more common errors that you will find in life. Well, I guess no one else wants a t-shirt. That's a damn lie, and you know it. Give me a shirt. You heard him, girls. Hey, t-shirt, t-shirt, t-shirt. Fire! Ooh, a bobby pin. Oh! Maud? Oh, my Lord, she's dead. <gasps> oh. So, generally speaking, we would hope that some sort of design error uh, that leads to uh, people being distracted, like Homer was distracted by a bobby pin, it would not actually lead to somebody's death, but conceivably, yeah, distractions could lead to injury, death, uh, major equipment damage, millions of dollars being lost. Yeah, so the th idea here is you don't want to put your blame on the user. Instead, what you want to do is redesign your systems, redesign your interface, redesign your documentation, so that people can use it well and effectively and make as few errors as possible. So that's on you, the designer. So you need to know about categories of error. What different categories errors fall into so you can track what sort of errors people do make and then figure out how to prevent those errors. So let's talk about how to keep from making our users say, don't. We have slips and we have mistakes. Slips are things that the user thinks that she or he is gonna do but ends up doing something else. They're subconscious. They're done without thinking, and there are two major classes of these. Then we have mistakes. Mistakes are conscious. The user thinks about it and does the wrong thing actively. There are three different classes of these. We'll discuss them in some detail on the next slides. First off, let's talk about slips. Slips, as noted, are subconscious. The idea is a person is going to do something I want to do thing A, but they end up doing thing B, which they didn't intend to do. So these will happen in the specify, perform, interpret, and perceive stages. As I said, there are two different major categories of these. There are action-based and memory lapse. Let's talk about action-based. There are three subtypes in the action base. There are capture slips, description similarity slips, and mode error slips. In capture slips, the person performing the action intends to do one thing, but something that that person does more frequently, quote unquote, captures the activity and does it instead. So, uh, well, we'll give examples as we go along here. Then in the description similarity slip, the user is performing the correct action, but doing it on the wrong thing. So that may be a case of the wrong button. It may be designed similarly. It may be in the same place. All sorts of possibilities. Then we have mode errors. A mode error is when a device that the user is using has different functions that uh, are located in the same space, but they work differently depending on what function is activated on the machine. Then we have memory lapse slips. In these, memory just fails. The person doesn't remember that they are going to do something and they just don't do it. Then we have mistakes. Mistakes are conscious. Remember, the difference here is that slips are unconscious and mistakes are conscious. So mistakes happen when people think about what they are doing instead of working on autopilot. So in mistakes, a person establishes the wrong goal or forms the wrong plan. There are three different sorts of these. There are rule-based, knowledge-based, and memory lapse-based. In the rule-based, the user figures out Okay, here's what's going on in this situation. I need to behave in this manner. But they choose the wrong way to behave or they follow the wrong rule to uh, make the thing work the way they do. Then we have knowledge-based. The user 
doesn't understand what the problem is. They have wrong information, they have incomplete information, so they make mistakes that may have serious consequences just because they are not well informed. Then we have memory lapses. This is where the user forgets something at the stage of goals. So this is going to be often due to interruptions. They won't just forget to do something, they're going to get distracted usually and not end up doing it. Do you remember this graphic? We've got the bridge of execution, the bridge of evaluation, the six different uh, steps on the way with the goal up top, the seventh step. Here's the deal. Mistakes happen up here in the reflective part and slips happen down here in the other four. So plan and compare have mistakes, specify, interpret, perform, and perceive. Those are all involved with slips. How about we look at some examples of these various things and help uh, make them more concrete in your minds. First off, let's look at an example of a capture slip. Remember, in a capture slip, somebody intends to do something, but they slip and they do something else that is similar instead. Here's an example from National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Before we begin, since this is Aunt Bethany's 80th Christmas, I think she should lead us in the saying of grace. Oh. What, dear? Grace! Grace! She passed away 30 years ago. They want you to say grace. The blessing! I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. 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 All right. So as we can see, the intended activity, saying the blessing, got captured by the doing the Pledge of Allegiance instead. That's a capture slip. A description similarity slip, the idea is the user is doing the right thing, but on the wrong thing. So the right action on the wrong object. We'll use an example from The Simpsons. A little bit of background. This is a Halloween episode. This is where Homer uh, buys a matter transporter. In, just, in other words, a, he's got two devices. Walk in one, walk out the other. Man, how do I ever live without this thing? Whoa! Oh! oh, man, that's good. All right, the right action, drinking this stuff out of the can, but on the wrong can. That's a description similarity slip. We have then mode error slips. The idea here is that the thing is going to have different states, different modes, the same controls have different meanings or functions. For example, take a look at this thing. This is a keyboard. Matter of fact, this is the same keyboard I like to use at home. Uh, it's just no particular reason. It's the one I like. So. It has, however, some uh, modes that can cause problems. The one that everybody has on all their computers, and matter of fact, most typewriters, is a caps lock function. When you hit the caps lock function, every time you hit a letter, it'll go capital letters, right? And so you may have done this on your cell phones when you are texting. You start texting, you realize it's all caps. Oh no, I'm being rude, I'm shouting. You don't want to do that. That's a mode error slip. We've also got this thing up here in the corner. This is a little slider switch. What this slider switch does is it changes the mode for all of these keys. I don't know if you can see it very well, but on the uh, F9, F10, F11, and F12 keys, those are all for media play. So for example, the uh, F9 key is play and pause. If you have that switch slid over to the Fn where it is right now, that those functions will not work. 
So you may be pounding them. Why won't this? I can't stop my music. I need to pause this. It just keeps going. So this is a mode error slip. What's going to happen is somebody will not realize that the machine, the interface, is in a different mode and they can't get the result they want. We then have rule-based mistakes. But the idea behind a rule-based mistake is that the user is figuring out what's going on and they're figuring it out accurately, but they're picking the wrong thing to do. So, for example, this is, this is a traffic light. We've all seen these before. What are you supposed to do when you see a yellow light? Well, two possibilities. One, you're fairly close, just hit the gas, go through to make sure nobody rear-ends you. You're far enough away, just push the brakes, make sure you don't go through and start to run the red light. But sometimes when you follow the, uh, you diagnose the situation correctly, you can still choose the wrong thing to do and end up kind of like this. Crash involving four cars sends one person to the hospital. Two cars collided at about 7.30 on Ridge Road at Brotherton in Oakley. A van trying to beat the yellow light was turning on to Brotherton when it was hit by a car also trying to beat the light. They crashed into two other cars. One driver was taken to the hospital with a neck injury. So they noticed what was going on with the yellow light, but they chose the wrong thing to do and got injured as a result. Then we have knowledge-based mistakes. In this case, the user doesn't understand the problem because they don't have the right information. So here's a classic example, international relations. You meet somebody from a different culture, what is it that you do? Um, uh, the guy at the left, he's looking to shake hands. The Asian fellow is bowing, holding out the business card, thinking, oh no, this is awkward. The lady in the middle, from a culture that doesn't have a, a lot of personal space. The fellow in the yellow shirt is leaning back thinking, ah, too close, too close, too close. The fellow on the right is like, ah, I'm just confused. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do next. So these people all lack information or they have the wrong information about what to do and they are making social faux pas. When you design interfaces, when you design documentation, anytime you design something that people work with, Make sure that they have enough information that they know what it is they are supposed to do. Then we have mistakes, such as a memory lapse mistake. In this case, the user is forgiving something at the stage of setting a goal. This is Kent Brockman, live at the Springfield Post Office on Tax Day. It's literally the 11th hour, 10 p.m., and tardy taxpayers are scrambling to mail their returns by midnight. Sir, why did you wait until the last minute to pay your taxes? Taxes? Isn't this the line from Metallica? Sir, uh, why did you wait until the last minute to pay your taxes? Because I'm an idiot. Happy? Of course, not everyone is an idiot. Some of us took our receipts and pay stubs to our accountants months ago. And at the risk of sounding a little smug... Oh, help! Does anyone have a calculator? Myron? No. Will you look at those morons? I paid my taxes over a year ago. Dad. What is it, sweetie? Did you see a scary picture in your picture book? That was last year's taxes. You have to pay again this year. No, because, you see, I went ahead and, year-wise, I was counting forward from the last previous... Don't! I put the tax forms on top of your to-do pile a month ago. I have a to-do pile? <gasps> March, how many kids do we have? Oh, no time to count. I'll just estimate. Uh, nine. So you get the point there. <laughs> The thing we need to do then is to figure out how to prevent errors from happening. One of the good things you can do is follow the uh, five whys procedure. Here it is. Here's how it works. So let's take a look at the problem solving method known as the five whys, or also causal chains. And let's take a look, first of all, at how that relates to the uh, problem solving funnel as a, as, a, as a frame, where we begin with a high level problem. It might be something that's vague, it's something that we don't fully understand, but it's the problem coming at us on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis. What we want to do is break the problem down to understand it, get some data, get some facts, look for patterns, and from there that means understanding the work. This is a, certainly a characteristic of lean problem solving, which is to deeply go and observe and understand the work. From there we can identify a point of occurrence, also sometimes called the direct, called the direct cause. 
uh, can also be thought of as a problem in its own right. Now, we can do the fun part, which is to start to ask the five whys. We can put on our investigative hats and ask why, why, why is this occurring? That will lead us to a root cause regarding which we can attach a countermeasure. So to look at this part of the problem solving process, uh, the five whys or causal chain, let's look at the uh, famous example from Taiichi Ono of Toyota and the one that he used starting in the 1950s of a machine breaking down. So the problem that he saw as the manager of the machine shop was machines would often break down and his people would often just attach a Band-Aid. They would only stop it at the, at the first level of cause, meaning that the problems would recur, they would come back. So he trained himself and his people then to always ask the five whys, sometimes three, sometimes eight, the point being to follow the causal chain all the way down to a root cause. So in the, this example, he looked at a machine that had stopped working and identified with the first why that it had blown a fuse in the control box because it was overloaded. The overload caused the fuse to blow. Then he didn't stop there, he asked why again, uh, and recognized that insufficient lubrication was getting to the bearing. So the bearing, therefore, was causing the overload on the machine. Not stopping there, he went to the next cause and asking why, found that the pump was not drawing lubricant, so the lu lubricant then would not be sent to the bearing. Still not stopping there, okay, why, again, was the pump not drawing lubricant? Because the shaft was worn, causing it to rattle and not function properly. Now, another why there led him to a root cause, which was that there was no strainer that allowed metal chips to enter in and damage the pump. So with the damaged shaft, that would mean that the pump wasn't drawing lubricant so that there wasn't enough lubrication going to the bearing that overloaded the machine and blew a fuse and that stopped the machine from working. So he's got a five Y causal chain going down to the root cause and you can check that with a therefore chain going up uh, as well. So now he knows if I apply a countermeasure here which is to make sure there's a stranger then the problem will be solved so that it doesn't come back. So this is what can be accomplished with a fairly simple way of thinking so that we're not just putting band-aids on symptoms, that we're solving problems at the root cause. Good luck in your problem-solving attempts. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So if you start asking why, 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 why going down the chain, you'll end up with some root causes, and those things you as a designer can fix. Let's talk about a couple of other ways to prevent errors. One of the things you want to avoid doing is asking people to do things that are unnatural. Now, unnatural has all sorts of possible definitions, but think about what are people comfortable doing? What do they like doing? Is it physically possible for them to do things? Do you want them to pay attention for 20, 30, 40 minutes, concentrating intently all the time? It's really, really hard to do and probably a really bad idea. So don't ask people to do things that, that are hard to do. Make all the instructions clear, make them public. If you hide instructions, it ain't no good. Make sure the instructions are out somewhere where people can access them all the time. Use constraints well. Build them in, or better yet, use the ones that are implicit and follow along with them. Guide people in their behaviors. Use good mappings. We've talked about this a little bit in the past videos and in your past readings, but think about where do people associate things with? Where do their mental models line things up? If I flip this switch, where should it show, have a result? So use a natural mappings as whenever you can. Let people back up. Make sure that you build in the possibility for people to stop paying attention and then come back. Make sure that people give uh, people feed forward, that is information about what to do next. And make sure you provide lots of information about what people have done. If people perform an action and get no result from it, they may start doing it again and again and again, hitting that switch multiple times, pressing the button, and they may crash the computer or whatever have you. So make sure that you tell people what they can do, where they're, where they're going, tell them where they're going, and also let them know that whatever it is that they have done has an effect and that if, if something is working in the background, Give them at least that whirling thing, that little whirly device to say, yeah, I'm working on it. I'll be back. These are the big ideas from Chapter 5 that I want you to make sure you get. So take notes on these ideas. Come back, rewatch the video as need be. And if you have questions, please email me. 
Email address is jarnet11 at kennesaw.edu. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks very much.